Thank you very much, Dr. Cropper, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be speaking at this meeting today and especially pleased to be part of the session honoring my longtime friend, Keith Thompson. Uh, Keith and I have known each other for over 30 years, a friendship that began as colleagues at the Academy of Natural Sciences, now part of Drexel University, uh, about, well, late 1980s and continues happily to the present day. Uh, as you've heard, the four topics chosen for this morning's session are all ones that we thought Keith would enjoy. It's my pleasure to start off with Edward Lear, a writer whose limericks and nonsense Keith has known and loved since childhood, but who also made important contributions in natural history, especially ornithology, a subject of interest to Keith for almost as long. That Mr. Lear was a fellow Englishman is another happy overlap in the two men's circle of intersection. While Lear's not as well known here in the United States as in the UK, what most people know about him, if they know about him at all, is his role as a children's book writer and illustrator. He has a plaque in Poets' Corner at Westminster Abbey besides that of Lewis Carroll, his contemporary and fellow nonsense poet, acknowledging his influence on English literature and celebrating such popular poems as The Owl and the Pussycat. In 1988, the British government honored him with a set of postage stamps featuring four of his whimsical ink drawings. The affable Lear would have been astonished and no doubt pleased by his country's philatelic attention but almost certainly disappointed by the choice of images with which the Royal Mail chose to mark the centennial of his death. He would probably have preferred to be remembered for his serious landscape paintings or for the natural history work for which he began his career. We tend to think of Edward Lear as a jolly, rotund Victorian with a wonderful sense of humor a man who made children laugh by gently poking fun at the improbable foibles of eccentric adults not unlike himself. All of this is certainly one part of Edward Lear. But the Lear I want to tell you about this morning is a younger, slightly more serious man, an artist who dazzled the scientific world with paintings of birds the likes of which no one had seen before. It's a wonderful story of a modest, self-taught talent reshaping the worlds of art and science. It's the story of a man whose emergence as an artist was perfectly timed to coincide with those interesting years of the British Empire in which, let's see, I'm gonna go back here, in which naturalists in the newly settled colonies in Australia, India, Africa, and elsewhere were collecting and sending to London an astonishing array of new birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, insects and plants, which in turn fostered an appetite for the books about them among the aristocracy and rising middle class. The London Zoo, which opened its gardens in Regent's Park in 1828, was where Lear first encountered many of these exotic creatures and where he would focus much of his attention in the early years of his career. He was the 20th of 21 children born in 1812 to a middle-class family in a village suburb north of London. And I should say that was the same mother and father for all 21 of those. <laughs> a reversal in family fortune when he was just four years old caused the family to be dispersed. And Lear was raised by his oldest sister, Anne, 21 years his senior. His artistic talent and appealing personality rather than his family connections, would ultimately take him from a modest upbringing in North London to Osborne House and Buckingham Palace, where in 1846, he served as the drawing instructor to a young Queen Victoria. But I'm getting ahead of myself and ahead of the story. Let me return to the very beginning of Lear's artistic career. While not a great deal has survived from this period, we're fortunate to have several albums created between 1827 and 1830, when Lear was just 15 or 16 years old. At least two of the albums were evidently created by Anne Lear, who was a talented artist in her own right, with the help of Edward, who was, under her tutelage, then just learning the rudiments of drawing. 
so similar in style are many of the pictures in these albums that were some of them not signed, it would be impossible to say who painted which. The pheasants on the left are clearly signed by Anne, though you may not be able to see it from where you're seated. The birds on the right could be by either Anne or Edward, though I suspect the latter. One thing you'll notice in all of these early works is that both the botanical illustrations and the birds tend to be very colorful and highly imaginary. Every so often, however, a picture emerges from these albums that appears to be more than generic. In this red and yellow macaw, for example, we see the childlike treatment of a landscape coupled with a very original and realistic pose and attitude in the bird itself. This is almost certainly a bird painted from life by a young Edward Lear, whose ability to capture the vitality of his subjects would only improve with time. Elsewhere in the albums are images that move dramatically from the imaginary world of his childhood to the very real world of the London Zoo, which opened to the public serendipitously just as Lear was growing interested in natural history. Scientific illustration in the early 19th century tended to be still and lifeless, much as it had been for the previous 200 years. Specimens were generally shown in profile against a white background. Trees and branches were used as necessary devices to support specimens that had been drawn from skins rather than from living birds. The same was true with books on mammals, as you can see in these plates from Edward Godman's American Natural History, published in 1826. Edward Lear and his American contemporary, John James Audubon, were about to change that. But I'll speak more about this shortly. For the moment, let me stick with Edward Lear's emergence as an artist. After several years of making small amounts of money drawing what he described as, quote, morbid disease drawings for hospitals and certain doctors of physic, such as the ones you see on the walls here, Lear received his first commission to create illustrations for publication when William Bennett, a founder and longtime officer of the Zoological Society, asked him to supply an unknown number of vignettes to enliven his two-volume work on the animals at the zoo. Strangely, and unfortunately for Lear, his work was not acknowledged in the book. We know of his contributions only because he inserted his subtle but distinctive EL monogram in the backgrounds of two of the illustrations. And I think you can see on the right-hand screen, it looks a bit like the British pound sterling sign, which is no coincidence. I'm sure this was a pun uh, on Lear about how little he was being paid for these works. <laughs> Sometime in 1827 or 28, possibly before the Zoological Society opened its doors to the public, Lear conceived and began working on a portfolio of drawings of birds and animals in the zoological gardens that he intended to market as individual lithographs, sold in sets with the idea that they could be enjoyed as prints or be bound and, and retained as a book. For a 16 or 17 year old artist with no experience in publishing and no independent resources to back this venture, this was a remarkably ambitious undertaking. It's significant because it is unquestionably Lear's first self-publishing effort. Though unmentioned by Lear or Lear scholars until now, the project has just enough surviving remnants on both sides of the Atlantic to confirm its existence and to raise questions about why it was attempted and why it failed. This is one of only a few of the plates that are known to survive from this early work. Whether Lear lost interest in the project or found it too difficult to fund, we do not know. But in any case, he appears to have abandoned the venture by the end of 1829. Perhaps he had already shifted his focus from an amorphous audience of general zoo visitors to a more committed and better funded audience. The new patrons he had identified were a group of serious aviculturists, and specifically the small group of collectors who were interested in acquiring and raising the colorful members of the parrot family as pets and status symbols. These exotic birds were in the 1820s and 30s arriving in London from Australia, Africa, and South America in increasing numbers. They were being acquired at considerable expense, not just for the zoo, but for private aviaries on the great country estates throughout the British Isles. 
Lear was fascinated by the birds and saw in their owners a possible audience for his artistic talent. In April 1830, at the age of 18, Lear requested permission from the Council of the Zoological Society to have access to their parrots for the purpose of creating a book on the subject. Permission was granted, and for the next two years, Lear spent much of his time drawing these colorful creatures from life. Fortunately, at least 30 of Lear's working drawings and paintings for this great parrot monograph have survived, and most of them are owned by the Houghton Library at Harvard. They still impart a sense of excitement and spontaneity. Even Audubon's studies from this period, most of which were made from dead specimens, fail to capture the sense of vitality that can be seen in many of Lear's studies. And I mention Audubon here not just because his name is so much better known as a painter of birds here in the United States and because he was a member of the American Philosophical Society, but because he is one of the very few other artists of the period who had comparable ability. Although Audubon was a full generation older than Lear, the two began work on their respective bird books in London in the very same year, 1827. Unlike Lear, Audubon's production was something of a team effort. He generally focused on the birds and had assistants paint the backgrounds and floral details. He also had the help of Robert Havell Jr., arguably the best engraver of the 19th century, who took Audubon's paintings and turned them into the magnificent hand-colored double elephant folio aquatint prints that we so admire today. And the APS owns a full set of these in the building across the street. By contrast, Lear did everything himself, including the transfer of his watercolor studies onto lithographic stone for printing. Audubon's contemporary, John Gould, the chief taxidermist and curator at the London Zoo when Lear was working on his parrot monograph, was to play a very important part in Lear's professional life. He was a mentor to Lear, but also something of a competitor, for he had just then begun uh, to launch his own career as an author and publisher of ornithological books. He recognized Lear's talent and offered to employ him as an illustrator and an instructor of his wife, Elizabeth. Like Lear, Elizabeth was an entirely self-taught artist, but she was far less capable than Lear. Gould had charged her with making all of the plates for his first book, and she was struggling to do so while also raising a young family. Here is one of Elizabeth Gould's illustrations for John Gould's A Century of Birds Hitherto Unfigured from the Himalayan Mountains. And here's another. And I show you this in particular so that you can compare Elizabeth Gould's owl with an owl plate made for her husband at about the same time by her younger teacher. And here you can see the two illustrations side by side. I like to call it the, the perky owl and the limp owl, and you can tell <laughs> Whose is whose? Fortunately, the two artists got along well, and Lear was able to improve Elizabeth Gould's style in the years they worked together. Lear and John Gould had a complex relationship, much too complex for me to get into this morning. Oh. But in the end, Lear made 68 magnificent plates for Gould's five-volume work on the birds of Europe, as well as 10 of the 34 plates in Gould's monograph of Toucans, many of which Gould credited to himself, even though Lear had clearly drawn the paintings. In later years, Lear complained that Gould was driving and heartless, exploiting all those who worked for him, including his wife. Fortunately, Lear had made a strong enough impression through his own publication that his reputation was secure with or without a byline in Gould's work. Lear's reputation earned him many commissions, including a large number of illustrations for the popular Naturalist's Library, edited by William Jardine, in which Lear's work was engraved by William Lazars, the Scottish engraver who had done the first 10 plates for Audubon's Birds of America. Lazars, who had seen the work of many fine artists, including Audubon, once wrote to a friend, Lear's drawings are nature, all others are pottery ware. During the 1830s, Lear may have helped John and Elizabeth Gould with some of the plates for Charles Darwin's report 
on the zoological findings of his voyage on HMS Beagle, but evidence of this relationship is so far only circumstantial. Lear had many patrons over the years, but the most important and most generous of these was Edward Stanley, the 13th Earl of Derby, one of the wealthiest men in England and president of the Zoological Society at the time he, he first came into contact with Lear. In the summer of 1830, Lord Stanley invited Lear to travel north to Knowsley Hall, his sprawling estate near Liverpool. The Earl owned the largest private menagerie then in England with as many as 620 different bird species and more than 20,000 living and preserved animal specimens by the time it was dispersed in 1851. He wished to have Edward Lear document the rarest and most important of these specimens. Despite a warm welcome from the Earl and his extended family, Lear found life at Knowsley Hall very intimidating. He reported that there were as many as 30 servants serving at every meal. But fortunately for Lear, there were also many children in the hall. When he wasn't working on his more formal portraits of birds and mammals, Lear entertained them with nonsensical poems and fun-filled alphabets. It was at Knowsley Hall, in fact, that Lear's life as a children's writer and illustrator began. As much as Lord Darby appreciated the fun and laughter Lear brought to Knowsley Hall, it was Lear's talent as a natural history artist that garnered his long-term patronage and support. This night monkey, or Vito, painted from a specimen in Lord Darby's collection, was eventually turned into a lithograph, and with 16 other illustrations by Lear, privately published by Lord Darby in 1846 in a book entitled Gleanings from the Menagerie and Avery at Knowsley Hall. The book was both stunningly beautiful and scientifically significant, with a text by John Edward Gray, the keeper of zoology at the British Museum. Never sold on the open market, Gleanings from the Menagerie now ranks among the rarest and most sought after of 19th century natural history books. As the decade of the 1830s reached the halfway point, Lear found himself overwhelmed by commissions. I am up to my neck in hurry and work from 5 a.m. till 7 p.m. without cessation, he wrote a friend. Despite the near universal acclaim that his illustrations received for their accuracy and beauty, some of Lear's work was still being published without recognition, as in these plates from Thomas Bell's A History of British Quadrupeds, published in 1837. Fortunately, the Houghton Li Library owns Lear's own annotated copy of the book, in which he marked his contributions so that we know just which plates he created. You can't read it probably, but it says drawn from life by me, Edward Lear, on these plates, so there's no doubt. For the most part, however, Lear was given credit for his paintings. But in a classic example of being careful what you wish for, Lear was becoming overwhelmed and exhausted by the exacting work he was being asked to do. He often complained about his poor health and failing eyesight. Nothing smaller than an ostrich shall I soon be able to see, he complained to John Gould in 1835. Fortunately for Lear, and for all of us, his eyesight never failed him completely. By the time of his death in San Remo, Italy in 1888, he had created almost 400 natural history paintings, more than 7,000 watercolors of his travels in Europe the Greek Isles, the Middle East, and India, about 2,000 studio watercolors, and more than 300 oil paintings. In addition to his limericks and nonsense poetry, he published five illustrated travel books, a monograph on parrots, as we've heard, and more than 200 other lithographs of birds, mammals, and reptiles from various parts of the world. An amazing production by any standard. There's much more to say about Edward Lear's remarkable life and his influence on other artists and writers, ranging from Beatrix Potter to Maurice Sendak, and from Edward Gorey to Walton Ford. But the timer on my podium tells me that uh, my time is up, so I'll have to leave the rest of the story to my book on Lear as a natural history artist, which was published last year by David Godine. In closing, 
I want to thank the Society for allowing me to share this snapshot of his life, to thank Keith and Linda Thompson for their long friendship, and to thank all of you for your attention this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to do questions, or should we move on? Oh, we have to have questions. Do you want to do a question? Okay. I do believe we have time for some questions. Um, Yes. Oh, we, I think oh. we're waiting for a mic here. Okay. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Mike? <laughs> Michael Silverstein from Chicago. Um, I, um, and when you, uh, towards your conclusion, you were talking about the incredible productivity of Lear during, in all of these different media and different genres. Um, um, uh, I presume that he made a very comfortable living ultimately. Well, um, that, 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 that and the did question not is, have to is a good one because he didn't. I mean, that's the oh. astounding thing. He was he was poverty stricken through most of his life, and he was. Uh, is that why he wound up in Italy? Yeah, he did. He <laughs> <laughs> no, he loved Italy. He he <laughs> went to Italy, but first for the climate, and then fell in love with it. Spending ten years in Rome right at the beginning, uh, and then eventually buying the the land in San Remo. But from there, using that as a base, he traveled all over Europe. But he. He loved life, and he traveled extensively, often staying with friends and guests, which, er, uh, where he was a guest, which helped uh, the expenses. Uh, but he never made much money. Uh, he, I think he was not a good businessman. Uh, he went sort of hand to mouth, and occasionally had to turn back to Lord Darby and his successors uh, for patronage to, to help him pay for his new house and, and so on. So it was a sort of a sad life in that regard. Uh, he left most of his paintings that hadn't been sold uh, to good friends in England, uh, and those sub subsequently came out on the market right after, w w well, between World War I and World War II, which is why so many of them ended up at Harvard. Yes. Uh, Mark Thompson, from New York. Um, can you perhaps just elaborate come o o off that last answer? A little bit about how, how about you, how you think of Lear uh, as a as a creative figure, um, with this, uh, as you said, in many ways, sad life. Epilepsy, I think, was a w dogged him throughout his life, and mm. he's widely believed to have been gay and 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 to struggled with relationships as well. But so we have these two rather disparate creative outputs: exquisite uh, landscape and, and natural history images. The very beguiling verse and 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 nonsense cartoons, but uh, but uh, in some ways a very difficult and fraught life. Yes, well, he put all of his energy into this work. He he was a prolific letter writer. He made countless sketches, drawings. Uh, seemed to produce hundreds of drawings every day. Some people think art historians in the room may wish to comment on this, but that that his own productivity almost worked against him in the end. He he sort of flooded the market with too much. Uh, he also went out of fashion for a while. He always aspired to be an oil painter, even though he was really much better at, at his watercolors. Uh, and the oils, he did huge things. Uh, they look a little overworked, a little dark, a little Victorian for our today's standards. Uh, whereas the watercolors are very full of light and bright and cheerful, uh, and that they're, they're quite captivating. Uh, he, you're, you're quite right about his challenges in, in close personal relationships. He had a terrible series of health issues. He had epilepsy, and so he was very reluctant to go out in public or to be in social events where he might be uh, affected by a seizure. Uh, and that m some think that that may be why he had a hard time uh, establishing the, the permanent relationships. But he did have close friends, uh, and was much beloved by everyone who knew him, from children on. Of course, he never had children of his own, but, but he managed to be at home with them, and everyone commented how how much children loved him because they thought he was one of them. <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Anybody? Well, maybe we should. Uh, I can. Having so many siblings must have been quite a difficult start. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. He didn't really uh, relate to the rest of his siblings as much. There were, there were a couple of. He had one very good friend, uh, a sister, in addition to Anne. Uh, who also helped him with his painting. She was a botanical artist, and, and one or two others. 
but there were quite a few that there's no surviving correspondence, there's no mention of them in his diaries and so on, and I think because the family had been so dispersed, he really didn't get to know them. Two of them came to the, the America and were involved in the American Civil War, and the Lear Jet that we all know about is the, actually the same family line, comes to the present time. Thank you so much, Bob, thank you.